Hello everyone, welcome to our live virtual healthy living event. Hurley received the Get With The Guidelines Stroke Gold Elite Plus Quality Achievement Award from the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association. Corzat accreditation shows our heart program stands up to vigorous evaluation in coronary infections, interventions, cath lab performance, surgery, and cardiac rehabilitation. And if you haven't heard, we were just named one of the world's best smart hospitals by Newsweek Magazine. Today, we hope to bring a lot of that expertise to you because when it comes to a stroke, seconds count. We do also wanna thank all of our Mid Michigan Now fans who are joining us live for the first time for one of our healthy living events. So thanks for being here. We do have a neurologist and a cardiologist who are going to take your questions live today. All you have to do is submit them on Facebook, our YouTube channel, or you can text me directly at 248-935-2562. We will get your answers here live. We'd like to welcome Dr. Mahmoud Shakfi, who is accredited by the Electrodiagnostic Medicine Board, American Board of Electrodiagnostic Medicine. He is board certified in neuromuscular medicine, general neurology, and ECFMG. Dr. Shafi did his fellowship with University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center, as well as residencies at University Hospitals Case Medical Center, Hurley, and Mafrak Hospital. He's married with two kids and has some great information for us. Welcome, doctor. Thank you very much for the short introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. I'll start my uh, talk today about talking about the epidemiology and how common is stroke. If you look at the cases, we have almost 795,000 cases per year here in the United States. It's the leading cause of disability. People lose their job because of stroke. And if you look at the death mortality overall, it's the fifth cause of death in the United States. Uh, worldwide, it's actually second. So usually here in the United States because we have more kind of treatment that is initiated earlier, you could see, see the mortality drop significantly from second to being the fifth. Now what's the definition of stroke? It's usually when there is interruption of the blood to certain area in the brain, and usually this is being diagnosed based on clinical criteria. Also we do have some supportive testing to be done. Usually we, we go with imaging. We have here an example of an image where basically the area which is the white part is the damaged area, and this is a sign of basically a stroke in this area. Now when we go over the stroke, most of the time we think it's basically, we, we divide them or into ischemic type, which basically where there is interruption of the blood supply, which is the common type of stroke. However, we also worry about sometimes it could be a bleed. Uh, and usually the bleed happens when there is disruption of the blood vessels and usually in the setting of high blood pressure. And usually, again, how to differentiate between them by looking at the imaging, you will see basically in the CAT scan there is area which is kind of bright. And usually this is the area where there is bleed. So one thing about it, you know, again, if you look at the percentage, it's 90% is the ischemic stroke, which is the common one. However, there's 10% which is hemorrhagic. One common mistake I've seen with people when they come to the hospital is pretty much almost on a weekly basis. Uh, when they have the stroke symptoms, they decide to go ahead and take aspirin before they come to the hospital. And this is kind of a wrong practice, because again, if you look, there's a chance you may have a bleed, and usually when you take aspirin, it will make the bleed worse. So please, it's always not a good idea to take any medications prior to arrival to the hospital, especially in stroke cases. Now, when we go to stroke, there is two definitions I would like to share. There is what we call it the stroke core. It's basically, this is the dead area. Usually, uh, when there is reduction of the blood flow, we are talking about uh, only 15% of the blood is reaching that tissue the ischemic core will happen. And unfortunately, this is the dead area that usually we cannot do much about it. I mean, uh, the, our main concern is what we call it the penumbra. Is this is the area kind of adjacent to the core infarct. It's the area kind of in between. When there is the blood flow is around 40%, this area you can save. So this is where we kind of really we push to ask the uh, patients usually to come as soon as possible to the hospitals. Because this area, if you, was, you get it on time, you open the vessels or you give the right medications, you may get this part 
uh, functions as back as before. While again, the core infarct is the area where kind of unfortunately we lose the function, we cannot get it back. So usually in the early stage of the stroke, you will have more penumbra and less core infarct. The more you wait, the penumbra numbers will decrease, the core infarct will increase. So the earlier you get, there's better chance you may get your function uh, a better way or, uh, or faster. Now, one thing about the symptoms in general, uh, just I wanna, uh, the phrase is be fast. So it can affect any function actually of your brain. You can affect your balance, sorry. Can affect your balance, can affect your vision, can affect your face, your arm, your speech. So if you have, not necessarily all of them, if you have any of them, one of them is enough to call the ambulance right, right quickly. Again, don't wait. The more you call, you, the earlier you come to the hospital, the better usually is the outcome. And usually, again, just to go over certain picture here, this is a picture of face droop. I mean, over the right side, you can see the right facial droop compared to the normal side in the other side of the slide. This is a sign of a weakness over the right side or the right arm. You, you ask the patient basically, or you ask your relatives to lift their arm up. And if there is any drop in the arm, this is a sign of stroke. And again, it can happen also to the leg. So not again, one important point, we don't have to wait till you have all the symptoms. If you have any of them, and again, usually happens suddenly, you call 911 and come to the hospital. Please again, avoid any medications to take at home, usually in the hospital. Again, just to go over it, you, when you arrive, they will check you, you will check the blood pressure first. They are gonna take you for urgent imaging. And usually we start with the CT head and the CT head again to rule out the bleed part. Usually when we rule out the bleed part, this is where we kind of work with medications. They'll check your heart rhythm, certain strokes we'll talk about later will be coming from your heart. And usually we look to, uh, to exclude other causes that may present like stroke, sometimes like low blood sugar. Some people with low blood sugar, they may present like stroke. So we try to rule out the stuff that's treated in different way. Uh, again, there's other images now we are using. We call it C CT perfusion and CTA. And sometimes we may need to get an MRI urgently in the ER, just basically to, if we're still not sure about the diagnosis at that time. One important thing about the treatment, again, time, time is matter. Again, as we said, seconds does matter. If you look here at the TPA, usually this is the common treatment we use in acute stroke. It should be administered not more than four and a half hours. More than four and a half hours, actually it's harmful. There is high risk of bleed. So you have to present to the stroke or present to the hospital as soon as possible. Ideally, we like to be less than three hours before we administer the medications. Certain cases, we can extend it up to 4.5 hours. If patient doesn't qualify for TPA for other reasons, some people, for example, they had recent surgery, they had recent bleed somewhere else, we worry about bleeding at other organs, we may need to use an aspirin. Ideally, again, we give it earlier in the, in the course of the treatment. If the patient received IBTPA, usually we wait 24 hours. And lastly, which is the most important, I want to emphasize about the mechanical thrombectomy. So it used to be in the past just medical treatment for the stroke, but later now, over I think it's in the five or six years, we do have what we call it mechanical thrombectomy, where we basically, this is why we get the vessel image or the CTA to look if there is any major vessels that's blocked. And that's the case, and usually this mechanical thrombectomy, actually if you look at the TPA, we have up to four point, or four and a half hours, we have up to 24 hours. So we have really kind of more time frame or uh, than the TPA. We can go in uh, with the angiogram or the, the catheter through your groin or sometimes with through the wrist and go to the major vessel and try to remove the clot. And the other thing I wanna discuss, if you look here, there is what we call it NNT or this is what we call it number needed to treat. So if you look at the mechanical thrombectomy, usually the lower the number, the better usually the outcome. If you treat just two people, you'll see the difference. Usually with TPA, like you see eight patients or like if between three, three to four and a half hours, you need to treat 14 patients to see one patient like major improvement. While in mechanical thrombectomy, usually you see it almost every other patient. So this is what we try in the hospital to speed up also the timing. You know, we try to get the scans within 30 minutes. If we decide, for example, usually when the patient arrives the hospital, also there is a code stroke or activation of stroke team. The neurologist will be following from, usually if they are in the hospital, they will walk into the ER. If the patients, for example, arrive at night, usually they will be activated. They will call the neurologist right away at home. 
the ER physician will be here in the uh, emergency the moment you arrive to the ER. And again, they will do the basic screening, uh, basic clinical examination, get the CT scan, and then when, if we decide to go with the IVTPA, we usually, our goal always to give it within 60 minutes of arrival to, to, to ED. And later on, again, we get the rest of medic, uh, imaging, like the CTA or CT perfusion, to look at the major vessels to see what's the percentage of the core infarct, as we talked about, the penumbra, which vessels is blocked, to determine if you qualify also for mechanical thrombectomy. And usually, with, when we decide about mechanical thrombectomy, we usually, again, we push for it as soon as possible. We are talking if the TPA within 60 minutes, this is kind of around the same range. And later on, this is kind of an acute treatment, or I'm talking about in the first 24 hour of uh, presentation to ED. So basically, this is just a summary about the basic testing. Again, we do glucose, blood pressure control. We start with CT head, the CTA, CT perfusion. Usually, we get these in the uh, emergency department. Later on, I mean later on when the patient get admitted, we need to find out what's the source or the cause of stroke. We need to do other testing. Sometimes we do carotid Doppler. Uh, we do sometimes cardiac imaging like echocardiogram to see what's the source of the stroke. And again, meanwhile, we need to make sure there is no mimickers, your blood sugar is normal, some certain electrolytes may present like a stroke, and we like to check them meanwhile. This is an example of what we call it a CT perfusion image. If you look at the picture over the right side, so the area, basically this is, uh, the, the area which is a blue in color is the basically the area that's getting less blood supply. And usually this is help us to estimate usually what's the so, uh, size of the stroke and in general help us to know if the, if we do mechanical thrombectomy, is there, is there will, like the benefit is it going to be significant, or what's the so what's the risk of bleed usually? Now, going over some pathophysiology, the majority of stroke, if you look at it, is coming from a vascular risk factor. Like when we are talking about vascular risk factor, is the hypertension, diabetes, and cholesterol. And usually, these damage your blood vessels in general. They will be forming a plaque. These plaques usually with time, they will rupture, they will form farther, uh, what we call it, accumulation of platelets. And these with time will block the vessels and will be the source for uh, stroke in the future. And if you look at it, it's a process of timing. It's not gonna happen over day. It's usually, we're talking about a process of, uh, of, of diseases for a couple of months or years. The other sources of stroke that can happen is actually cardiac causes, like common cause, we call it AFib. And you'll see, and usually with, when someone has AFib, we usually, even before, as a preventative, we put patient on anticoagulation. Certain time that stroke is because of major vessel occlusion, we call it carotid disease, and usually these will require surgical intervention later on uh, to open up the vessels. Now going over the risk factor, there is some unmodifiable risk factor. One of them is the age, and usually the age is 55. Usually the stroke double after the age of 55. Family history, some people, they do have a risk of a higher risk of stroke than other people. And also if you have a prior history of coronary artery disease, stroke, or TIA. There is risk factor which is modifiable, which always we'd like to discuss with the patients. And if you look at it, most of them is basically because it affects the vessels overall like hypertension, uh, sedentary lifestyle, smoking, diabetes, cholesterol, obesity, alcoholism, sleep apnea, and also AFib uh, related to cardiac disease, basically. When it comes to the uh, prevention or secondary prevention, so again, when we talked about the TPA, it's basically the acute treatment in the hospital. However, when you are discharged from the hospital, most of the time you will be on uh, medications. Usually we go with antiplatelet. The commonest one we hear about is aspirin. There is other alternative you may hear, Plavix, Berlenta, or Ticagrelor. Sometimes you will be on anticoagulation like Coumadin. Uh, again, we emphasize about the importance of blood pressure control uh, as it is a modifiable risk factor. Again, in case of there is a major occlusion in your carotid artery, we may need to consider surgical intervention to open up the vessels. We emphasize about also cholesterol uh, modification. In general, usually our main target is your LDL, and we look at less than 70 milligram per deciliter. And in general, most people, when they have a stroke, we do put them on anti uh, or cholesterol medication. 
We, it's very important also about to talk about uh, smoking cessation. Uh, certainly, once you have a stroke, or even as a preventative, primary prevention, not only secondary prevention, smoking will increase your stroke uh, at a larger portion or amount. Uh, diet is important because, it's, again, it has an indirect control in your blood pressure, your diabetes, your cholesterol, and also exercise has the same effect. When it comes to blood pressure con uh, control, 50% of the stroke, actually, if you think, it's more, most likely related to hypertension. So if you drop your blood pressure by 10, uh, uh, 10 for the systolic blood pressure or 5 for the diastolic blood pressure, if you look at the decreased risk of stroke up to 7%. And the second thing is cholesterol. Again, there is certain medication we use to control this, uh, the stroke. Uh, usually the statin group is the commonest one. And again, overall, the outcome usually improves with statin medications. Smoking cessation is important, and you could see the percentage that if you go with the group, the percentage of improving your uh, chance to uh, kind of uh, stop cigarettes and basically use other group it's helpful you could see there is alternative if in case you cannot stop it by yourself there is certainly there are certain things that we could help to help you uh, quit smoking uh, and again this is I want to emphasize about the smoking cessation I mean it's if you if there is anything usually uh, again why smoking stopping smoking will affect your blood pressure will affect usually also your uh, the, uh, the hardening of the vessels will get uh, significantly better. So this is why we always emphasize about that. Now going over the diet is also important because all indirectly it will affect your blood pressure and also your blood glucose level. And we call about what we call it the DASH diet, which is low sodium uh, diet. And also they will have rich uh, in uh, whole grain, fruits, vegetables and less red meat. And usually if you look at that, it has significant effect. Usually, it's more studied actually in coronary artery disease or MI. You could see 63% reduction in non-fatal MI and up to 70% decrease in mortality. Uh, one important thing, some people they say, okay, we go to diet soda or diet coke just to decrease our uh, sugar intake. But actually overall, it did show a study that even diet, uh, diet soda in general is not helpful in stroke and actually keep the same percentage uh, uh, when it comes to the risk. Important of exercise, and again, in general, exercise affect your high blood pressure, affect your diabetes control, uh, help with the obesity part. And in general, we recommend up to 30, per, 30 minutes of exercise, a majority of the week, like four to five days per week, up to 30 minutes. And usually it should be an aerobic exercise, uh, which again, uh, overall outcome will be improving if you look at different multiple factors. Uh, it's, it's again, it helps with LDL, it helps with your BMI, and also with the major thing is the high blood pressure. And there is just to go over it, there is multiple studies, like if you look at that studied the uh, effect of uh, basically exercises, and all of them kind of in agreement that's actually it's very helpful and something, sometimes we ignore it, we go, oh, okay, you know, medical treatment, but cer certainly diet and exercises has a main uh, goal and uh, in the treatment part. Uh, basically, this is just to go over exercise, and you see uh, the number needed to treat up to 11 patients. So you could see even if you treat people up to out of 11, they will have significant improvement just by doing exercises. So in conclusion, stroke is common thing and happen almost everywhere. Uh, important thing is the time. We in stroke we are talking about seconds. The earlier to present to the ER, the better usually the outcome. And again, now with the new modalities and treatment with mechanical thrombectomy, we have up to 24 hours where we can intervene. Uh, and again, we have multiple modalities. We go with the clinical examination. We use kind of uh, multiple imaging. We try to give the treatment as soon as possible once the person or the patients arrive to the ER. And again, as a communications, usually when the patients arrive to the ER, we do have a code stroke team where the neurologist, if they are not in house, they get uh, uh, notified about the patient arrival. We have the ER physician and nursing staff to try to get uh, uh, testing done and treatment as soon as possible. And I think this is my, thank you.
Dr. Shackby will now take some questions. You can get yours in by texting 248-935-2562, or you can go on Facebook or YouTube. Um, Dr. Shackby, uh, the first question that came in is, is stroke hereditary? Certainly, there are certain types of stroke. With, uh, it's hereditary. I mean, it's certain there is genetic diseases that can, can contribute to stroke. There is the most common, what we call it, hereditary disease that causes stroke. We call it cadizal disease and it's well known, we know the gene for that. As if now we don't have a treatment for that gene, I'm sure there is uh, research work on that. But right now we work mainly on risk modifications and also like the antiplatelet uh, to prevent it from, again, like recurrence of the stroke. Ben is asking, uh, my father is always tired since having a stroke. Will that last forever? So fatigue is part of the stroke symptoms. And again, it depends where is the area of the stroke. Uh, certainly, I mean, some of them will be reversible. Again, we need to do, we will have more information about what kind of reason they mean by the word fatigue and also the location of the stroke. Certainly, there is certain medication now recommended kind of to increase your uh, fatigue or to improve your fatigue symptoms that we can discuss. Again, it's case by case. Usually these cases we would like to discuss either like uh, need to talk to your neurologist or your primary care to go over the options available. Someone says, I've always been told you take aspirin if you're having a heart attack, but with a stroke, you don't take aspirin? Yeah, I, again, this is an important message I want to give. I, I think if you get just this message is enough because I've seen it a lot, almost on a weekly basis. It is really a big mistake to take aspirin before arrival to ER. Again, there is a chance 20% you may have a bleed in your brain, and when you take this aspirin, it's going to get worse. So you just basically, if you have any stroke-like symptoms, you just call 911 and come to the ER. You will need a head imaging to determine if you need a, like aspirin or other treatment options. In case if it is bleed, actually we need to reverse the bleed in that case. How much rehabilitation is typically needed after a stroke? So it's again different from case to case. Some people, they do improve significantly earlier in the treatment, but in general, I tell people you have majority of stroke patients, they will need up to three months. We're seeing up to 70% of stroke patients, they do see some improvement by three months. Some people, they actually may require more than, more, more than that. They can go up to one year. But in average, we're talking about like between inpatient and outpatient up to three months. How much time do you have to get to the hospital to get that medication that stops a stroke? So again, the, when it comes to the treatment, we have the TPA. We have the window up to four and a half hours. And again, the earlier you come, the better the outcome. Uh, if you come within one hour, if we give it within one hour, it's definitely the outcome is not gonna be the same if you come after three and a half hours. So even the timing with the medication, it make a difference. And this question came in on Facebook and they're saying, what should a bystander do? What do you do if you see somebody having those symptoms? So again, the first thing you do is call 911 and uh, try to bring the person to the ER as soon as possible. And again, you try to avoid injury. If someone is about to fall, you try to kind of put him in a sitting position or make him lay down. But otherwise, I don't think there is medication you could administer or anything like that. Hurley is a primary stroke center. What does that mean, that doctors are ready to go if you come in with a stroke? So yes, I mean here at Hurley, if someone comes with stroke, we have the medications we can administer. We can also arrange for the mechanical thrombectomy. So we kind of have the acute treatment. And later on, as a secondary prevention program, we do have programs. We do have a stroke unit here, and also rehabilitation program. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. That was a lot of great information. Thank you. Next, we welcome Dr. Louie Alcatab, who is board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, and interventional cardiology. He completed his residency at the world-renowned Cleveland Clinic and had dual fellowships at Boston University Medical Center and the University of Connecticut. Dr. Elkatab is our Director of Interventional Cardiology here at Hurley and founding partner of Advanced Cardiology Clinic. So we are happy to be bringing his expertise to you as it relates to high blood pressure and stroke. Now he did just come out of an emergency procedure, so we're, we're so glad that he was able to make it up here and um, give his presentation today. So thank you so much, Doctor, for uh, making it here and being here. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, speak uh, about this extremely important issue. And um, I'm grateful to have heard uh, Dr. Shukve speak about uh, stroke. A uh, very important topic and, uh, you know, time is always of the essence. We're always on the go. If you have an opportunity to save somebody's life and somebody's quality of life by bringing them to the hospital, like Dr. Shukve said, that would be the one intervention that uh, would be incredible. I think my job here is more so secondary to speak about one problem that is so common and creates the probably one of the biggest risk factors for stroke, and that is hypertension. Um, I think the first question that we should ask ourselves is, what is hypertension? And we'll look at it in, in the manner of numbers. I think people have numbers out there available for them all the time to question do I have a high blood pressure or not? And typically speaking, if the higher number, the systolic blood pressure is over 140, or the lower number, the diastolic pressure is over 90, that by itself conveys that a person indeed does have high blood pressure. But that also has different stages. Somebody can have mild hypertension, which we call stage one. Somebody can have a, a stage two hypertension as well different underlying clinical conditions classify the hypertension and its importance of treatment in very different categories. I think the best thing to start with is to speak about what is a high blood pressure. When we understand where the product of the high blood pressure comes from, it starts making sense of why we say this is not good for you. Number one, it is the workload of the heart, how strong the heart is pumping the blood. Number two, it's the blood vessels, the arteries, these conduits that take life to the rest of our body with the oxygenated blood that receive that amount of pressure. The product of these two important functions, it uh, is what creates the normal blood pressure. When that is increased, understandably, that will create a constant sheer power on the arteries, on these conduits that take, like I said, life to the human body and thereby creating injury. With that, we have uh, many terrible complications. Uh, many people have uh, these complications and suffer from it. But let's talk about a little bit of uh, numbers, which are at much, much higher risk of these issues. If you look at people who are older, about 56 million of them are uh, eligible for treatment for high blood pressure and high cholesterol. We have 23 million adults who have type 2 diabetes mellitus. We have 1 million people who have uh, a heart attack in the past or more. The point is, this is an extremely at-risk population if we're not thinking about the general public. So we have the general public that have the problem with high blood pressure, and we have all these populations with other disease processes that are at incredible risk. I think the biggest problem with high blood pressure or hypertension is that most people don't know that they have it. In fact, one survey looked at about one in every five women don't know that they have high blood pressure. We go about our life making an assumption that the blood pressure is normal or that if it was checked one time and it was elevated, we give ourselves some false uh, assurance that the blood pressure is normal. Now, that's not a point to scare everybody. People don't have to have high blood pressure, but it's very important for them to recognize it when they do. More so in men. Men are always, you know, uh, at risk more than uh, ladies. I think if I have men and women of similar age and similar backgrounds, men will always have a high risk. So one in four men have blood pressure that is elevated and they are not aware of it. When you think that we have that many numbers, 20% of women, 25% of men, that have high blood pressure that is untreated, and I take you back to that initial slide, you could only imagine how many problems can be prevented if we treat this issue. So what are the problems that come from untreated high blood pressure? In fact, none of them, none of them is something that anyone would ever hope to see. Kidney failure, re renal disease, 
definitely not the least is myocardial infarction and heart attacks and congestive heart failure, uh, vision loss, and the topic that we talk about today which is extremely important and that is stroke. There are other things that are also very important that may affect our daily life. Uh, constant and recurrent headaches, unexplained headaches, uh, sexual dysfunction, all these things are long-term complications and sometimes short-term complications of untreated high blood pressure. So take us back to stroke. I think Dr. Shukfei uh, spoke about it eloquently and explained everything, but the most important point that I want to uh, convey to you is that the arteries in the brain become weakened, hardened, they create turbulence, which in turn can create thrombosis and clotting, not to mention uh, embolic disease of stroke that can be a result of high blood pressure that produces heart problems. As you can see, the problem becomes uh, very diffuse in the body and very common. Blood vessels are spread everywhere. They're spread in the brain, in the heart, in the kidneys, in the lower extremities. They reach every organ. And unfortunately, hypertension affects everything where the blood vessels are concerned. So this is a message of hope and improvement. What can we do? Well, the first thing to do is know your numbers. I think managing high blood pressure to prevent stroke is a critical issue and a critical message. If we don't know what our blood pressure is, then we're not treating it. And it is never an issue of the doctor alone treating a person's high blood pressure. It has to be a cooperation between the patient and the physician. So the best number to remember to take home is if your blood pressure is above 140 over 90, that is most definitely abnormal. The World Health Organization recommends that you act immediately on that and not wait at all. We have uh, what we call a normal blood pressure, which is less than 120 over 80. When was the last time you've heard someone that has that good of a high, that good of a blood pressure? I think mo almost everyone who is listening to me now is shaking their head saying, I don't know about that. My blood pressure was 130 and I thought it was normal. Well, 130, 120 to 130, we call it elevated blood pressure. Sometimes we call it prehypertension, but it, it's certainly not normal. What normal is, is to be less than 120 over 80. Now, there's a lot of people that say, well, I don't feel good when my blood pressure is that low. That's understandable. And that's where your physician has to individualize every case and treat it accordingly in order to treat the patient, not just the number. But if you were gonna remember anything, remember that 140 over 90 is definitely abnormal and that requires action immediately. Now, why do I say it requires action immediately? Not because there is an immediate complication of a single episode of high blood pressure, no. We say you have to act immediately because this is a long-term problem, but the more we delay it and the more we don't take care of it, the longer it's gonna have an impact over the years. Another important point, if you are going to know your numbers, you need to know how to measure your blood pressure correctly. And measuring blood pressure requires that the arm is at the level of the heart, in a quiet environment, in a position where the patient or the person getting his blood pressure checked is sitting and comfortable and relaxed. Of course, we don't go to someone who's angry or scared or standing up or just exerted some effort and check their blood pressure. It may be elevated and it should be elevated. When we exert effort, one of the physiological responses of our body is for heart to beat faster and for our blood vessels to constrict in order to deliver the amount of nutrition needed to all our organs during that time of stress. So, you've learned that you have high blood pressure or someone you care about has high blood pressure. You've alerted your doctor. The next step is to aim for excellent blood pressure control. Ideally, we would like to see that within three months. If the age is over 65 years of age, achieving 140 over 90 or less is a pretty good target. But if the age is younger than 65, then our goal should be far more ambitious. We should aim for a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80. And for those who tolerate it without getting any symptoms such as lightheadedness or discomfort, we should aim for an ideal blood pressure 
of 120 over 70. This message is an invitation for you to talk to your doctor. Make sure that it's a cooperation between you and your physician. Make sure that you know your numbers because your physician will see you in a visit maybe once a month, maybe once every six months. They're not with you at home. With current technology and um, development in the world, anyone or almost anyone should be able to get a proper blood pressure cuff if they have high blood pressure and to monitor their own blood pressure at home. This will be a great addition to know whether the medications are working or not. Which takes me to the next issue. Which medication do we use? We're very fortunate and lucky to know that there are many options to treat high blood pressure. Different medications have a different impact on the human body and there are medications that we call first line, second line, and adjunct therapy. Who should get what? Now, this definitely has to be tailored to the specific patient. And this is why it's not a very simple job of take this medication or that over the counter. Your physician will know what other conditions you have, what medications have historically, based on our uh, background and based on our ethnicity, work best. In fact, there are population studies where we know that certain medication might work for one population and actually cause harm in the other. Our job as physicians is to look at the patient, learn their background, and understand what works best for them. Secondly, we talk about other conditions associated, whether the patient has congestive heart failure or kidney insufficiency, so forth and so on. And then finally, side effects. Every medication has some side effect. It will never be possible for us to know readily who will have a side effect from medication and who will not. There's a certain percentage of patients that will suffer from particular side effects. Some are tolerable, some are not. So there will be an attempt by your physician to try and treat with different options until they find what would be best for every person. Um, I will finish by uh, saying the following. The most important thing to do is, first of all, to have a diagnosis. Second, to take the step to speak to your physician about treatment. And third, to be party to that treatment, particularly when it comes to medications, reporting to your physician about any potential side effects, and making sure that you get your blood pressure checked at home. Last but not the least, uh, we could help ourselves be with other things besides medication. Of course, we will talk about diet and exercise until we are blue in the face, but we should never give that up. Lifestyle changes in terms of changing our diet, improving our diet, putting ourselves on a spectrum if we're on the bad side, maybe inch slowly to a much better diet is very important. High blood pressure is a chronic problem and it lasts over many, many, many years with its impact. And similarly, if we lower our blood pressure over many, many, many years, then the opposite of that will happen and we'll have much healthier organs. I think I will stop at that point. I hope this was a, a quick review uh, to bring attention to this uh, problem and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, you can get your questions in to Dr. El Qatab by texting me directly at 248-935-2562 or go on Facebook or YouTube. And uh, as always, when you join us, we are getting a lot of questions in, so right. we'll jump right into it. Um, the first question is, is excessive swelling of the legs uh, from hypertension, or what causes that? Very common problem. Unfortunately, there can be some serious reasons to have excessive swelling of the legs, such as congestive heart failure, and that needs to be attended to immediately. There are lesser problems or less serious problems such as venous stasis where the veins in the legs are not functioning as well as they should. And then lastly, uh, it could actually be a side effect of a medication. This is why it should be looked at uh, with your physician. Uh, just to follow up, Rena had asked if water gain has anything to do with hypertension or stroke or being diabetic and how do you treat it? It's kind of in the same line. It's, right? it's in the same line and the question is what did the blood pressure do to the rest of the organs that now we are having uh, venous stasis and uh, fluid buildup. 
Mary says, I monitor my own blood pressure at home. I have a digital arm cuff and another device that goes on my wrist, but they give different readings when done one after another. Which cuff is giving the most accurate information? Personally, I prefer the uh, cuff that goes around the arm that tests the brachial artery. And actually, the fact that different devices give different results has to do with a couple of things. Number one, our blood pressure is never exactly the same. So if the differences are minor in one or two degrees, that's probably not a significant difference. Secondly, it's the position of the arm. As I've stated before, you need to learn how to measure your blood pressure correctly, uh, preferably in a e either seating or semi-seating position with the arm spread and on a flat surface at the level of the heart. These are the two things that will make the differences, and I think I prefer the brachial artery, which are the uh, arm ones more. This question that came in ties to that, is there a best time to take the blood pressure? Is it first thing in the day or at night? When should you take it? That's an excellent question, actually. Most people, when I ask them, when do you think our blood pressure is highest? And uh, some people tell me when I come back from work or when I'm upset. Well, that's a special situation. But physiologically, our blood pressure is very high when we wake up or is highest, because that's when you're revving up the engine and all the hormones are waking up and we're coming up to life, so to speak. It is a good thing if you're looking at the impact of medication to check the blood pressure when you wake up. It is reasonable to check it later on at different times in the day to kind of draw some sort of a chart to help you figure out when we are in control and when we are not. When we exercise or exert effort, it is normal for our blood pressure to go up. The important thing is for it to not become too hypertensive with exertion. Um, I think I know what you're going to say to this, but I'm going to let you answer so that they know. Um, a lengthy question, someone was at a restaurant, their left leg collapsed and they uh, kind of collapsed down. It took a little while, but they eventually walked to their car and they're wondering what to do. See your doctor, right? <laughs> was the food good? <laughs> That's the first question. No. Yes, unfortunately, this, this is too involved uh, to give a, an answer just on the air. And anytime somebody's asking you know, you a question here, they probably should be discussing with their own doctor, right? Absolutely. I think uh, the, these questions are helpful to answer. I give a general uh, uh, answer. However, you know, the message is to speak to your doctor. The only problem is, and I think where we bring attention to, is are people really speaking to their doctors? And they have to find the right when they go to their doctor to point a, a concern that they have. Julie asks, is my uh, hypertension, her or is hypertension hereditary? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately at this point in time, we call 90% of high blood pressure essential hypertension, meaning we can't really pinpoint a cause for it that is reversible. However, in 10% of the time, we are able to identify causes that are reversible. Uh, it is common in just like any other disease. If uh, someone has a family history of coronary artery disease, um, they might also have family history of high blood pressure and be more susceptible. But lifestyle can change that altogether. So it is a combination of both our genetics and what we have done over the years to our body. Linda says, it's been 10 years since my stroke and I have no sense of time. Um, do you think that that's related or? I think that's a question for Dr. Shukfei, more, okay. <laughs> more so than me. Okay, but some of these health things, um, you know, you, you would... Well, I'm sure, I, I mean, stroke for certain uh, can affect uh, specific areas in the brain where uh, particular functions can be impacted. And um, although to be very, very specific about the sense of time is something I have not necessarily dealt with, but the neurologist might have. Um, Linda says, I've been on meds to control high blood pressure for a couple of months. Am I going to be on them the rest of my life? Uh, well, it depends on how many medications and what are we starting with. If we're starting with someone who already leads a very healthy lifestyle, uh, they are cognizant of their diet and they exercise and they are of normal uh, weight, uh, chances are they're, you know, they have essential hypertension and they need to be on the medications. What I have found in my practice that patients who adapt to a healthier lifestyle, uh, diet and exercise, and are able to uh, improve their weight, 
they are either able to reduce the dosage of their medications, reduce the number of their medications, and in some cases completely come off of their medications. So depending on where you're at, uh, uh, I think that would uh, make a big difference. If I reduce, um, can I reduce my high blood pressure quickly with exercise and medicine? You touched on that, but is yeah. it something that could happen in a few months, or how, how long does it take if you really change your lifestyle? Yeah, it depends on where we're starting at. So if we're starting really at a point where someone is, is uh, you know, eats a very high salt diet, uh, very uh, a lot of uh, what we call junk food or food that is uh, impacted with a lot of uh, um, unhealthy um, uh, preservatives and they they change they may very well have a, a quick impact but you know what we've built over the years is hard to undo in a few weeks it looks like that's it for the questions. Um, as usual, you really give a lot of great answers for people. I know Thank that's you. why they, they give so many questions when you come on with us. I really do appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so much, Thank you very much. Doctor. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, such great advice. We do want to thank you all for joining us. You can make appointments with uh, either of these doctors by, of course, going to hurleymc.com anytime. We hope that you stay healthy and you have a great day. Bye, everyone.